Good day to you. You know, one of the most annoying questions that a professor can receive from a student is, do I need the book for this class? And it's not annoying for the reason that you may think, which is that a professor would assign a book and so therefore they want the students to read it, though not all professors use their books in fairness to a student mindset. That question is not annoying for that reason. It's annoying because the student is not seeking out the opportunity to read a book that has been suggested by a professor. And really, a book that's suggested by anybody is what I'm trying to get at here is the shame I'm trying to say. You know, books are really hard to get people today to read for many reasons, not people's fault because there's so much competition with the phone. And reading takes place elsewhere, it takes place online, it takes place when you pass people with t-shirts, etc. So reading is not necessarily something that people are doing less, but the book is not something that attracts people like it used to. And yet... A book is a really heady medium. Heady, I'm choosing that word on purpose, and I'm going to try and get that across. As I introduce our very first mass medium that we're going to be discussing in terms of the development of a technology, and then tracing that technology and its impact on society. Up until now, we haven't come to technologies, we haven't come to inventions like the book, and for much of the rest of the class, not all of it, we're going to be taking on successive inventions like the newspaper and radio and television, etc. For today, it's the book. And the book has a mighty permanence to it, does it not? I mean, when you say, I booked the airline flights, there's a permanence to that, right? And an excitement that goes with it. It's for real. We booked the flight. If somebody's been booked into jail, wow, that's serious. They've been booked into jail. And so book has a very heady meaning to it. A book is something that to many people is likened to a teddy bear. It's, a, it's an object that people kind of cradle. This one is called Dining with the Danes. Somebody got me that book because I love Danish food. I've been to Daymart a few times. The book is like something that we cradle. We take it to bed with us. It makes us feel secure in many ways. It has many of the same properties from that vantage point as the telephone. And so the book is unique among other media for that reason, and also because the book is a very individual experience, meaning when you take in a book, you do it by yourself. You do it by yourself. You're not sitting there usually and talking about the book unless you're in a class and that's expected or you're in a reading group, but most people are not reading a book that way. They're reading it, they're taking it in, they're learning about themselves or exploring dimensions of themselves through a one-on-one -on -one experience with the book. The book, though, is so important to thinking, and that's what I want to communicate most of all to you as a student and a potential reader of books. Not that I'm a fantastic reader of books, but I do like to read, and I'm looking forward to reading over the Christmas holiday here. So what I'm trying to say about the book is it changes your thinking. It allows you to think with detailed logic. In fact, we call it linear logic because when you learn to read, you're reading lines and you have to learn to trace your eyes across a page, drop down, come to the next line, drop down, and then build paragraphs into chapters. And then you end up with a kind of message that has to be constructed using your mind. So a book is something that encourages a way of thinking because of that process it is not encouraged that way of thinking by any other mass medium. And it allows you to be a very detailed thinker and somebody who can express themselves and analyze problems very well if you're a big reader. I say I'm not a big reader. I mean, I read all kinds of stuff. I got Rolling Stones books here. I've got, well, here's a book that I actually wrote called Comparing Media from Around the World. I'll say something more about that later. And here's a book that I'm reading for a class and I'm teaching. It really doesn't matter what you read as long as you read. That's what I'm trying to say here. Now let's move into the history of the book. Let's talk about where the origins of the book came from. In order to discuss that, we have to actually discuss the origins of writing. Because before there can be books, you have to have writing. And writing was a technology that was invented. It was invented around 3,500 B.C. in the Middle East. In the Middle East, we get writing. Only 3,000 500 BC is when writing comes on the scene. And just so I can put that into context, the spoken language is like 40,000 years old. 40,000 years old, human beings have been able to communicate by speaking using their mouths. The written language didn't come along until just 5,500 years ago or thereabouts. So 40,000 years versus 5,500 5, 5, years 
the spoken language was around for a, for a really long time, right? Before we get the written language. Writing allowed information to be stored for the first time. That's one of the most amazing things about it. You could take a grocery list because of writing down to the store, right? That's amazing. Imagine having to remember everything for a Thanksgiving meal if you're shopping for groceries and you have to do it all by your mind, which actually does speak to the point that memory got reduced when people started to read books because they knew that they could rely on those books. And we can even see that extended into cell phones, right? Like how many contacts, phone numbers do you have memorized right now? I don't even have my son's phone number memorized, even though I've been dialing it for a decade because I know it's in my contacts, right? And that's the same point I'm trying to make about books right now. Originally, reading and writing were elite skills, right? Not everybody had them. Only people who were literate, people who were educated, because you have to learn how to read and write. Right? That's what public schooling and private schooling is very much all about. But writing is not what you thought, at least the early invention. I don't think it is. So let's talk about what writing looked like. The very first kind of writing, and now I have a bunch of links you're going to want to set yourself up for as we go through this lecture. A lot of links in the email today. What writing early on consisted of first was a pictograph. A pictograph, that was the first kind of writing. A pictograph is pictures. It's pictures, right? Like a stop sign is a picture. It may say stop on it, but it's also a red ox octagon, right? So you know that what that means, right? And that's how early pictographs were, but here's how they were used. They were used mostly on cave walls because that's where human beings were congregating. Pictographs were mostly on cave walls in granite. They were etched in to the granite, right? And typically what they would show is how to harvest animals for food. They'd show when to kill an elk, for example. They'd show pictures of corn and, and whatnot about trying to teach people how to harp. That's, that's the early form of writing. I don't want to make it seem like that form of writing has gone away, by the way, because some Asian languages today, namely Chinese Mandarin, still use pictographs. They still use pictographs. Nevertheless, we get past the pictograph next to the ideograph. That's what come next, comes next in the development of writing, the ideograph. And that's where you have an abstract symbol that stands for an object or an idea. Like this, right? What is that, right? It's coming up in February, right? That's supposed to be a heart. It might be a lame example, right? But that, that stands for love. And love, love means a lot of things. It means forgiving people. It means showing affection towards people. It means showing appreciation for a lot of things with love. And that's what an ideograph is. It's an abstract symbol, like a heart, or an exclamation point, or an emoji with a thumbs up. Those are all examples of ideographs. Next up in the development of writing is phonography. Phonography is a system of writing in which symbols stand for sounds. It's a system of writing in which symbols stand for sounds. And so there are many different languages that have this phonography basis to them, but at the core of all of them, or at least most of them, not the Chinese, because that's a pic not Chinese Mandarin, because that's a pictograph based language, but at the core of phonography and really the entire structure of writing is the alphabet. It's the alphabet, which has letters that represent individual sounds. Individual sounds like a letter A can be an A, ah, or it can be an A sound, right? So this is what the alphabet allows us. It allows the human being to flex their communication through many different forms of expression using sounds. We get the alphabet around 1500 BC. So the first form of writing, which was pictographs, is 3500 BC in the Middle East. We get writing around 1500 BC, which makes it even really newer than we thought compared to how long the, spo the spoken language has been around. Now, where did writing take place? Well, let's talk about where paper came from. That's what we write on today if we're not writing on our cell phones and laptops. Before that, though, it was cave walls. I told you about that, but they're stationary. You're not moving them, right? So next up was the clay tablet. Just like Moses supposedly carried down from the mountains, the same shape form tablet, same, same shape as your cell phone actually. Tablet, very heavy. They break. Once the message is etched in, you can't change it. I mean, they were more mobile. You needed a, a donkey and a cart to move them, but more mobile than a cave wall, right? So we had, we had clay tablets for a while, and even rocks were used to some extent for writing on, until papyrus was used. Papyrus. Pa papyrus is made from reeds, you know, reeds that grow out of water, right? They're hollow, 
right? So those are mashed down and water is extracted from them. And that was the very first form of paper. And that was invented in Egypt. Egyptians came up with that in 3100 BC. So at that time you had you had pictographs being written on papyrus. But you can imagine it dries out, it rips up, it's rough. It's, it's not, you can't erase on or anything. Not that that was possible at that time. It, it gave way to the next invention, which was parchment. Parchment was goat skin. So goat skin dried out and then you write on it. And that also had some problems. Once it dried out, it roughed up, it started to curl. And, you know, it's very difficult to write evenly on goat skin, even though it was tougher than paper, uh, than, sorry, than parchment, uh, sorry, than papyrus, all these peas, right? Papyrus, parchment, and then finally we get paper. Paper was invented by the Chinese. The Chinese invented paper around 200 BC, around 200 BC. So there you have a kind of history of the origin of the of the written of the written language now that all the tools are in place people can say hey we can put pages together because we have paper we can bind them at one end we can have this thing called a book called a book and where were books originally written well they're not printed yet right they're written they were written in places called scriptoria 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 were monasteries you know where monks are monasteries were written where books were written and it would take five years to write an average book. Five years to write an average book. It took forever, right? So, and each book was individual. And if you made a mistake halfway down the page, you have to start all over with the page again. Can you imagine writing out a book? And monks had a lot of time on their hands. And so they were given that job. Until, until along comes the most significant invention in the history of mass media most people consider the most significant invention. I mentioned it in an earlier instructor video. It's called the, uh, the Guten, sorry, it's called, let me start over again. It's called the Gutenberg Printing Press. The Gutenberg Printing Press. And Johannes is the first name and Gutenberg is his last name. He was a metal worker in Germany. And he, had, he basically came up with this machine that would allow a human being to pull down on a lever. You can see it depicted in one of the links that I sent today. Pull down a lever, it would stamp out paper, and that paper could be pulled out. And you could put another sheet of paper in, pull down that lever, stamp that down, and you have the same words on two separate sheets of paper. And so you can start to standardize books. You can start to print them out in mass form. Here's page one, page one, page one, page one, page one. I just print out five copies of page one. It was a phenomenal change in the way that messages were created. It meant that people were getting identical copies of books for the first time because they weren't handwritten by scriptoria where somebody may have left out a word or had a different writing style. It was a phenomenal change in society that we're going to trot out in a few moments here, but just for the moment, let's fasten on to the fact that words could be produced very quickly and spread, standardized words to to really to masses of people, right? So we're first coming up with the word mass in this class. You're familiar with the word font, right? A lot of people play around with fonts. They have their own special font. Font means mountain of type. It means mountain of type. It's a Latin word. That's where that comes from. In italics, you know where that word comes from? We put book titles in italics. We put journal articles in italics. Sometimes we write love letters in italics. Italics come from Aldus Manutius, who's an Italian. And he invented that style of writing a language in 1501. And so Italian is just called italics. That's where that's coming from. And so now let's address the major change that happened because of the printing press. And what we can really say is that the printing press invented mass culture. It invented mass culture because it standardized books, it standardized languages, it, it got new languages to be used in printing that previously were, were smaller compared to Latin, newer languages like German. The printing press developed standard grammar and language, like where the exclamation point goes, even though in Spanish it's different from English, where quote marks go, all of that came about because of the printing press. And no less than the Protestant Reformation is responsible for the print, uh, sorry, is made possible, was made possible by the printing press, the Protestant Reformation, you know, where there was a breakaway from the, um, Catholic, Roman Catholic tradition into Lutheranism and then later Anglicanism. And 
that was because people who considered themselves to be average citizens, they were able to access God's word, the thinking was, on their own because of the Bible. The Bible was produced now as a book that was mass produced. It'd be sent all over the world, different versions, King James, whatever. And now people have standard access to a word of God, if you believe in God, and you don't need to go through the priest. And so the book changed the entire structure of how a God was worshipped in the form of nothing less than the Protestant Reformation. And extending this idea even further, the book created a scientific class. It created a way of gaining knowledge that was understood and appreciated like never before because it's in a book. And so you have science, you have the exploration of the world and the ocean and land and space and mountains, etc. And you have theories about illness and medical science and all of this because of the book. Now let's talk about books in our neck of the woods, the U.S., so to speak. The very first printing press in the New World, actually. The New World consists of Canada, the U.S., all down through Central America, South America. The very first printing press in this whole side of things of the world was in Mexico City. Mexico City in 1539. 1539. Printing began here in the U.S. with the whole book of Psalms. We've mentioned that before. That's that religious text. 1640, the whole book of Psalms began to be published. And Ben Franklin is coming up again because he is the person who established one of the very first libraries in Philadelphia, Ben Franklin, in 1731. Ben Franklin establishing a library. Libraries were not like they are today. You had to have a subscription to belong to them. They were very expensive. They were an elite club to go to, like a cigar club, I guess you could look at. One of Ben Franklin's early publications, aside from the Pennsylvania Gazette, I mentioned that last class. It's not a, not a book. It's a newspaper, right? But one of his early books was called and still is still around today, Richard's Almanac, Poor Richard's Almanac. Okay, big seller, 10,000 copies a year for Ben Franklin. That, those, that book predicts things like how, what the crop harvest is going to be for corn or what the rainfall is going to be or whether there are going to be more tornadoes. That's find that in, in Poor Richard's Almanac. Early books in the New World dealt mainly with three subjects. Mainly three subjects. You have animal husbandry. Now think about that for a minute, animal husbandry, how to take care of animals, and that's because you're living on a farm, usually. You're living in a rural area, it's prior to industrialization, so if your cow is sick and you don't heal your cow, you don't get milk. That's what it comes down to. So books helping with animal husbandry. Agriculture was a second area, similarly, you know, how to grow. You got to have your crop yields all ready to go for winter, otherwise you starve over winter, right? And the military, the military, a lot of conflict going on. I mean, the U.S. was not a country. It was a, it was a set of colonies that went through a revolution, an armed revolution with Britain to gain its freedom. Okay, now let's move to the next phase of books. Those are sort of, you know, early forms of books. Now we go into large-scale mass-produced books, large-scale mass-produced books like the one for this class. That's a large-scale mass-produced book. I think it fell on the floor. I was going to hold it up for you. Large-scale mass-produced books. What happens? Well, what happened, I should say, is industrialization. Industrialization, people moving from those rural areas to the cities. And in those cities, they're making a lot of money. They're also working in terrible conditions. That's a whole separate issue because they're in really unsafe factories. But they're working long hours. And then they have money to spend on the weekends. And so you start to have the emergence of a middle class. People with discretionary income, you know what that is, it's money you can spend on whatever you want. It's not just for eating, it's not just for shelter, it's it's a car, it's a, it's a bicycle pump, it's whatever. It's discretionary income. So that is the life that starts to develop in big cities like New York and Philadelphia with factories. People leaving the farm, they're going to school. And so in this environment, you have the rise of books because people are interested in diverting themselves into entertainment. There's no film. There's no TV. There's live singing and vaudeville. But books, that's entertainment for people. That's why you get serial novels. Serial novels are novels that are continuing a certain character like Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie. These were detective serial novels that were very, very very popular. And because of industrialization, the cost of producing a book came way down. You have all these machines. First they were human powered, and then later steam powered, and then later gasoline powered, 
oil powered as well, like electrical powered as well, machines that could print among other things that you would wear like t-shirts. Amongst other things, these machines would print print mass media very quickly. Books, right? So the price of books came way down and they were called dime novels. You could buy a whole book for a dime, 10 cents. Because the cost came down, now more people could afford books and therefore more people started to read. So the steam engine sped that up, made it very, very easy to produce books and fast, brought the books down to a dime. And then another inventor contributed to this. His name was Mergen Thaler. Mergen Thaler in 1885, that's the year that we're talking about here. We're talking about the 1800s for industrialization. But in 1885, Mergen Thaler developed a linotype typesetting machine. A linotype typesetting machine. Basically what that is is a keyboard that you can type things on instead of having to physically arrange letters and then pull down a press, like you can see in the video I sent you. Instead, the linotype machine is all about using a keyboard. That's where we get the, the quirky key, keyboard, if you know what that is, a keyboard to change letters around. It kind of makes the printing press like your, friger, your refrigerator. If you grew up in one of those families where you have all those letters and words and you can rearrange them and make funny sayings for the next family member to see, yeah, that, that's kind of what the Mergen Thaler printing press was like. These developments are said to have spurred democracy and mass literacy. Because democracy is all about the average person having their voice equally represented in policy-making decisions, usually at the government level. And usually that voice is expressed in terms of a vote. But in order to have a vote, you have to be educated, right? And so people didn't need to rely on leaders anymore as much as they could get their own information from books. So books spurred knowledge, which spurred democracy, and spurred mass literary, literacy. With the dime novel, people could, could afford books. Let's talk about buying and selling books now. In the 1900s is when books really became big business in the United States through publishing houses or publishers, as they are also called. Publishers are, are companies that buy manuscripts and they turn them into books. They turn them into books. Today, just like the other media industries we've talked about in this class, starting with the last class in media, media business, is there are only a, a handful of companies that control the publication of most of the books today. It's really down to five major publishers, Simon & Schuster being one of them, Penguin being another one. So those are the they control 90% of the, the, the sales of books, right? When you go to Barnes & Noble, the, those five publishers are raking in most of the money. When you go to airports, if you buy a book, same thing. It doesn't mean that there, there are not smaller presses, like there are university presses. My university, my where I got my PhD, Penn State University, has its own press. It tends to publish a lot in rhetoric, the field of rhetoric. So there are small presses, and they do a limited number of books on a on a specialty on specialty subjects, just like Rounding Some Corners is a small publisher. It's Fountainhead Press out of South Lake, Texas. There are also what are known as vanity presses. Vanity presses is where the author pays to be published, if you know what I mean. So there's not there's a lack of integrity to the process. It's not like the book is recognized by somebody external to the author and they say this is going to be a good idea. It's like the author says, I believe in myself, and so you purchase publishing through a vanity press and they produce your book. And you know, a lot of people do pursue that just so that they can get a book into publication. The government printing office is one of the largest publishers, actually. It's one of the nation's biggest publishers. It's got a lot to publish. It's got all those tax forms it has to do. It's got the Code of Federal Regulations. It's got regulations galore, really. All kinds of stuff coming out of the government printing office. Authors are still in society seen as having a status that makes them somewhat distinguished. If you are a book author, it automatically carries a distinguished air to your persona. It's the way it is. It doesn't matter what the book is. And that's because of that permanence of the book. It's because of the history of the book. It's because of the individualism of the book. It's because the book causes you to think in linear ways. So what's it like to be an author with the average publisher? I'm an author with two publishers. And usually what happens is the author gets an advance I got an advance for, for my book, Comparing Media from Around the World, which is no longer in print. It's out of date now. I did not get an advance for rounding some corners. What an advance is is where the pu publisher gives you money up front that you then pay back through your book sales. You don't get the money for free. You pay it back. 
My advance for comparing media from around the world was $3,500 back in the early 2000s when I wrote it. And I used that money to travel to the countries that I went to to interview officials to write my book. And that included, for example, France and Ghana, Africa. That's what I used my advance for. The publisher controls the content. They, they have complete, complete editorial control. Like You can hope that they accept your writing, but they have all the rights of eliminating things. And they also control the copyrights afterwards. It's not not your work anymore. They agree that they're going to pay you royalties, but they own the rights to that work. There's usually a review process. There was for my book, Comparing Media from Around the World, where you send your book in and then they go and get two or three people from the field and they say, we're not going to tell you who this is. You wrote the book, but we want you to read it and tell us what you think. And if they like it, that's a good review. At some point, you are provided with proofs. This is like the next to last stage before you have the book come out. Proofs are like the sheets of paper that you look at. You can last chance to collect to correct any mistakes. And then eventually, maybe there will be a profit in the textbook market, which is what mine was for. There's no real profit making. That's not why I wrote the book. I made $4.50 off each one, and the book didn't even sell 3,000 copies. So that wasn't, wasn't a point, but there is usually a royalty that's paid. Within the industry, I mentioned earlier that there are fewer and fewer players. There has actually been bookseller and distributor consolidation. Today, there is actually a huge wholesaler. You know what a wholesaler is. It's like a warehouse, right, that gets – the customer doesn't buy directly from a wholesaler. The wholesaler sells to retailers, and they have that in the book industry as well. And the biggest wholesaler in the world is the Ingram Book Company, the Ingram Book Company. Today, Barnes & Noble, probably no surprise to you, is the biggest chain – but by and large, the brick-and-mortar bookstore, even though we have a Barnes & Noble here at ESU, a brick-and-mortar store, it's going to be fading away as people move more into electronic readings of books. The textbook business is something that you know very well. If you're a student, you know that it seems like a big ripoff, the amount of money that you pay. The average student does spend a lot of money on books. We're talking over almost 1500 bucks for technology and supplies and books for each semester. And that's why you have a strong secondhand book market that's emerged. That's why you have book rentals. That's why you have ebooks, including for this class, ebooks are, are, are available. When we talk about the impact of books on culture now and the larger picture here, we know that the that the world of readers generally divides books into two kinds of books. There are serious literary books, that's one kind of books, and there are not so serious popular books, right? So Harry Potter, Twilight, Hunger Games, as great as they are, they're probably not considered serious books like a Shakespeare or a Thoreau or a John Steinbeck, any of these writers, if you happen to know them, there's kind of an elitism that takes place there. There's a New York Times bestseller list, and a lot of people look to the New York Times bestseller. People are choosing Christmas books based on that list right now. It's part of books and culture. Books are in our culture. There's a lot of teen series books. Teens find the ability to read books like Fifty Shades of Grey and learn about sexuality and other more private matters. Books and culture. Now let's go on to books and censorship. Censorship has come in the U.S. on the part of usually libraries, small town libraries, that's where books are centered. Not normally done by government, normally by libraries and some book vendors, vendors that sell, but mostly libraries. And we have had books that have been banned in the United States. We've got uh, The Scarlet Letter was banned. That was a book that I've read. That was a book about a about the Puritan era of the U.S. and a woman who had an affair with a preacher and uh, he was married and so she was made to wear a letter for embarrassment. That book talked about adultery, so it was banned. Um, of Mice and Men by John, John Steinbeck, that was banned because it contained profanity. Uh, Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare was banned because it promoted homosexuality. And more recently, Forever by Judy Bloom which is a book about a teenager's discovery, a female teenager's discovery of her sexuality, including wet dreams, masturbation, and menstruation, that is also seen banning. So what does it look like for the future of books? We're going to raise that question for all of the media in the class, and we're not going to come up with a lot of clear answers. I mean, who could see the media? Otherwise, you'd be uh, looking into a crystal ball and being an automatic gazillionaire. We know, though, that ebooks are going to have a place. Whether they're going to replace the actual physical turning of the page that people like and the glare problem that you still have, even if you take it down to the beach and charging a battery 
That remains to be seen, but we know more and more people, just because of the cost, are going to are going to seek them. We also know that printing on demand will remain big, and that's where a book is not printed in a run of three thousand copies or five thousand copies. Instead, when the book is is purchased, it's printed. It can be done very quickly with today's printing technology. So there you have it: the teddy bear, the book, the private individual medium that allows you to think so detailed. The book. Have a great day.